These bison were not released into the park. They were released to the north of the park. Then a group of them ventured inside. Then they stayed there, possibly because they found themselves a good food source. The purpose here is not necessarily to have as many bison as possible. It is to have a viable population that can be maintained in the long term. Daniel Forta and his team are at the highest point of the Prince Albert National Park in Saskatchewan. In this protected natural environment, the biologist studies the largest land mammal in North America, the bison. There are two main objectives. The first is to understand how the bison fits into the ecosystem here. The second is to try to reduce the conflict between humans and bison. For example, this population will periodically leave the park and cause damage on the outside. So what we try to do is to find a way to reduce their impact in a way that is acceptable to a national park. In bygone times, hundreds of thousands of plains bison roamed the Canadian prairies. Decimated by hunting, by the late 19th century, only a dozen or so specimens remained. Thanks to protection and conservation measures, the Canadian government has succeeded in saving the species from extinction. In 1969, around 50 plains bison were released in the hills north of Prince Albert National Park. That same year, some of the bison migrated inside the park boundaries to establish the only population of Canadian Plains bison roaming free in their historical natural habitat. What fascinates me about the bison is that firstly, it's an interesting species to observe for a researcher because it's constantly on the move. So for someone like me, who tries to understand what influences the spatial distribution of animals, it's an interesting species, especially in a naturally fragmented landscape like this one, with openings, clearings and meadows in a forest. Stretching over an area of around 4,000 square kilometers, the Prince Albert National Park is mostly made up of conifer and hardwood forest with scattered clearings. Constantly in search of food, bison move from meadow to meadow using a highly developed network of tracks. To study their behavior, Danielle and his team need to get as close as possible to the animals. Daniel, there's wolf tracks. There's a wolf pack that sort of roams this area. Uh, this is a beautiful track, right? You can see the pad very closely, and then the two fingers and the front fingers, and there you have the claws digging in. This is very fresh, because we were through here yesterday, so we know that these tracks occurred sometimes after 5 or 6 p.m. yesterday. It usually takes pretty large packs to attack a species as big as a bison. The bigger the pack, the more they have to attack large prey like bison, moose and wapiti. Bison have highly developed senses of smell and hearing. Having recorded the position of wolf tracks using GPS, the team advances quietly towards the clearing. Yeah, they're in the middle. There's a bison in the middle of the meadow. We've really got a group of them here. Maybe we can go around 
and come out further up. If we head into the woods, there may be some bison lying down. It might be easier if we go around because we'll make less noise. They're all at the edge of the wood. No luck. Because when I was down there, there were still some there at the edge of the wood. But by the time we'd crossed, they... Unfortunately, the bison were quicker and are already on their way to another pasture. Through the day, Daniel realizes that it will be impossible to catch the herd. They will have to try again tomorrow. To succeed in his plan to study plains bison, Daniel tries to observe their behavior as often as he can. But bison are not always easy to find. Daniel and his students are going to try again today to track down one of the herds in the park. An adult bison can weigh up to 1,000 kilos and measure around two meters. The group advances cautiously along the track. Bison are pretty good at telling you when they're not happy with you. They yeah. have some very clear signs, like they will maybe turn to the side and show you their body, or they will lift their tail up. So those are a couple really clear signs that they are not happy with your presence. This population is not so dangerous. There's always an element of risk when you're dealing with a bison, but it's not so dangerous because they're not used to human beings. When they start being used to seeing humans and reacting to them, that's when problems can start. Okay. There's a large group of us over there. The size and structure of herds of bisons vary constantly according to the season. Females and calves stick together summer and winter, while males are mostly solitary or form small groups. During the mating season, which runs from mid-July to late August, the males come to join the females. I counted 63 for now. We'll need to do a more accurate count. It's a large group, although we've seen them twice that size. There are probably about 15 right over there. When we're observing their behavior, we try to get within a hundred meters, maybe a little less. Then we settle in the woods and try to camouflage ourselves as much as possible. We don't want to disturb the animals or for them to know we're there. We want to see their natural behavior. We've got an increase in sound because there's a new male in the group. Part of our job is trying to ascertain the exact number of bison, and that's what Jared is trying to do, to arrive at an accurate figure of exactly how many bison there are. We're also trying to recognize individuals using cameras and photography. And so what we're doing is not only taking pictures of animals and identifying them by um, shapes and sizes. 
sizes of their horns, but also by other uh, characteristics such as marks, um, things that are permanent, tail missing, something like that. And so once we get a database of the animals that are in the population, we can monitor them over years and estimate things like survival, mortality, and the number of animals in the population from year to year. Thanks to observations carried out in the field, Danielle has been able to ascertain that the selection of plant life in a pasture and the spatial distribution of bison are also influenced by the risk of predation. There will still be plenty of food left when they leave here. Bison usually leave before the food supply is exhausted and before their energy gains diminish. So we believe that when facing a predator, like the wolf, which has a good spatial memory, it's better if your position in the space, in the park in this case, shouldn't be predictable. So the more you move and keep moving, the less chance there is that the wolf will be able to find you. But wolves usually have a better chance of finding a large group. Partly because they tend to leave more of their scent around, but also because they cover more space. On the other hand, being in a large group means less risk for different reasons. One is that in a large group, there are more individuals on the lookout at any given moment. There's also what's known as the dilution effect, meaning that if the wolves go on the attack and you're out on your own, then there's a good chance you're the one they'll come after. Whereas if there are, say, 88 of you, you have a 1 in 88 chance of being the victim. The population of Plains Bison in the Prince Albert National Park is now 200. As they are not fenced within the park boundaries, the bison sometimes venture outside onto private farmland. The park was doing its thing, um, but they were coming out a lot um, on farmers' land, and the park no longer is responsible for them at that point. We organized ourselves in 2006, formed, uh, incorporated our organization, and um, raised some money and have been working at it ever since. And it's really improved the, the, it's really improved the relationship between the ranchers and the bison. And that's really what the goal was. When they receive a call signaling the presence of bison, Members of the association gather to supervise the field borders and drive the animals back towards the park. Having one or two bison outside the park isn't usually such a big problem for landowners. But when you've got a group of 50 in your field, then a lot more damage can be done. It's important for us to study them in autumn because that's when problems and conflicts with the park's neighbors tend to occur. So it's vital for us to figure out exactly what influences their spatial distribution and their movements in autumn. We can't see and there's too many hills. So we're going to go, um, we're going to drive around. The road goes that way and um, it's a very bad road. We're hoping it's not too wet. We'll get as close as we can. Hopefully we can see them and we'll take the horses at that point. There's a spot there where they lay down often, so we'll go try and look. The team has to reach the bison quickly. The sooner they get there, the less chance there is of the animals damaging the farmland. To better understand how the different herds of bison move inside Prince Albert National Park, Daniel Fortin and his students have identified and mapped more than 200 trails used by bison. This is the whole park. 
and the bison are in the southwest part. We're going to focus on this part here, where there are a lot of excursions, where bison leave the park. It's important to identify the exit points. But it's not just a case of putting a fence up in the area, because they'll just go around it. What we want to do is to try to reduce the chances of them getting close to the boundary in the first place. So it's a matter of cutting off a certain number of links, which are the black lines you see here. These are theoretical, and they correspond broadly to the bison trails in the park. Today, we're going to check on the fence that has been erected here to see if it's still in place. We'll go take a look, do maintenance work, then complete the missing section of fence. In the first instance, we try to figure out how the bison move around within the park, knowing that the park is like a network linking parcels of resources, that is, the meadows, which form a kind of matrix in the forest. So by mapping the bison trails, we can try to figure out how the bison use this network of theirs. So for now, we're still trying to figure out their movements. We're working on fences, trying different types, and moving them around to maximize their effectiveness in limiting bison movements. And in the long term, we hope it will work as an adaptive management measure and help us restrict their excursions. That's why we work in close collaboration with the people who run the park. This is very promising, especially the two wires that I see there, I think. I think so too, and that'll make it easier to move. Yeah. And I think once we determine how long it takes for the bison to figure out that they can't get through there and then create this new trail, for that period of time, I, I'm hoping we'll have effectively stopped a lot of bison from moving towards the park boundary. What we're trying to do is figure out why the bison are where they are. There are lots of reasons for that, notably the risk of predation, but also the search for food. Within the park itself, we can explain a lot of the spatial distribution from the energy gains they make in different sectors. We figure it's probably the same outside the park. So right now, as it's autumn and the vegetation is dying inside the park due to the senescence of plant life, we wonder whether they venture outside the park because that's where new vegetation is growing after the harvest. We picked up a collar. Um, we had a pretty strong signal here um, on the scanner. So probably a kilometer, you know, for sure, closer than two kilometers. So, but we did pick one up. So, yeah, a very strong signal. So they're around somewhere. Because of the growing population, they often start to use more space. We've also noticed an expansion of the range of bison northward and a little westward but also outside the park. Once they're used to venturing into sectors, they develop the habit. And when there's good vegetation outside the park in autumn, then they'll keep going there until we find a way to regulate the problem. Gord and his team have finally spotted the bison. The group of horsemen ride up slowly to avoid creating any panic that might risk hurting the animals. Well, a good result. Um, we found bison on this land and we were able to move them back to the park. And, uh, you know, so a good result. The tolerance to the situation has increased significantly, and that's 
So, and really the goal is to reduce conflict. There was a time when the plains bison roamed the prairies in complete freedom. Since then, their habitat has shrunk considerably. Today in Canada, there remain no more than four herds living in the wild or semi-wild, along with a few small groups in captivity, representing in total around 1,000 head of bison. The Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada classifies the plains bison as an endangered species. One reason there aren't more bison in North America is because there isn't necessarily anywhere to put them. This is a species that needs a lot of space, so it's quite easy to come into conflict with humans. Daniel Fortin thinks the plains bison plays an essential role within the Prince Albert National Park ecosystem. Hence the need to protect them and look after their conservation. For me, it has an important role. It's a herbivore, so it's going to influence the plant communities and it's going to influence the distribution of the wolf. So it's a very important species in this ecosystem. I think it's important to consider that in the beginning there were bison, all this area is part of the historical range of the bison. So they really do have a very important role within the ecosystem. And if you're talking about the integrity of the ecosystem of Prince Albert National Park, then bison are a part of that. 